So my name is Anthony Shelton. I'm a director of the Museum of Anthropology at the University of British Columbia and professor of art history, visual arts and theory at, uh, or at the same university. I've been at the U Museum of Anthropology um, for 14 or 15 years. It's been the, uh, I don't think I've been at any other job so long. Normally I go to jobs for five years. I'm uh, encouraged by projects. Uh, I like project work and um, I do the project and I, I move on. So I've um, worked at the British Museum, the University of Coimbra in Portugal, um, um, the Horniman Museum, the Royal Pavilion Art Gallery and Museums uh, in Brighton. Um, I've um, spent time um, at the Smithsonian Institution. Uh, I came to Vancouver um, for a very large project. It was a development project to increase the size of the museum by 50% and build a research infrastructure. Um, and reconfigure most of the existing spaces um, here. So that was a big project, a $58 million project. Um, we, when I arrived, um, it appeared that we had full funding, but we had about $17 million. So um, I spent a couple of years raising uh, the rest of that money. <coughs> um, we started the project, um, we got uh, rid of a lot of our um, outside project people and uh, I'm really proud that um, our own staff actually take, took over a lot of those project streams including um, the building stream or overseeing the building stream and um, uh, collection enhancement, the digitization of the collection, the creation of a digital uh, interactive digital network called the Reciprocal Research Network, which we developed with um, four, uh, three different communities and um, four, four partners. Um, it resulted in the huge expansion of the museum um, from about 80,000 square feet to 115,000 square feet. We also enhanced, um, at that moment, we also kind of enhanced our public facilities because uh, I think, um, I think uh, in, to my mind, at that moment, we were still a university museum. So we didn't have marketing, we didn't have communication, we didn't fundraise, we didn't have development offices. Um, we had small committed temporary exhibition spaces that we programmed with the help of students rather than programming professionally and since 2010 when we reopened the new infrastructure we have um, I think began to kind of change really immeasurably um, both in terms of the professionalization in terms of becoming something of a mainstream museum but still committed to the same ideals so committed to working with communities to working on collaborative projects um, to um, to really doing exhibitions that are a little bit out of the box, that other places don't do. My background is I'm associated with something called critical museology, the development of critical museology. So over the last 30 years, I think I've written too many articles, 40-odd articles on critical museology. Um, and really, critical museology distinguishes between operational museology and critical uh, museology. It argues that what is often taught as museology is really operational, it's ideological, it's politically inflected more often than not. Um, it incorporates um, how museums uh, how museums operate, how they work, um, different professional types of knowledge, how those knowledges are stitched together, um, the professional organizations that regulate um, uh, museums and museum behavior, um, the courses, the higher education courses that um, staff and reproduce what museums do. And the job of a critical museology is to look critically at this and to, to, to deconstruct it. Um, 
this is something really I think in my position as a director as well as a as well as a teacher um, I'm able to uh, employ in the kind of exhibitions we do so we do a lot of critical exhibitions um, exhibitions which really have moved us from being a museum of anthropology um, because when we really moved to this new um, this new building in 1976 um, anthropology had mainly a monopoly over the study of culture, but since 1976, the development of the new art history, um, critical curatorial studies, um, critical studies, um, the uh, development of um, the work of uh, Foucault, Barth, um, uh, French thinkers, uh, post-colonial theory, cultural geography, um, has really destroyed the integrity, in my opinion, of a unitary discipline that you could call anthropology um, and instead we have a broad raft of disciplines um, that all look at culture so we've tried to move our practice away from a disciplinary based anthropology to this idea of if you like an anthropological imagination or a cultural imagination what we do is we're concerned with culture and we're not really concerned with disciplinary orientation so we've done exhibitions like um, The Marvelous Real, um, which was an exhibition uh, of Mexican art from 1926 to 2011. And we argued that um, Mexican art history had really been mediated through the work of French surrealism. And in fact, a lot of the characteristics given to Mexico, the um, violence of the landscape, the um, the the character types the that you find in Mexico were also kind of a product um, of uh, uh, of surrealist discourse. And um, what we did was we suggested a different kind of art history. So we took the work of um, Alejo Carpenti, a, a Cuban um, ethnomusicologist, museum uh, uh, philosopher, and um, novelist, most famously who came up with a different kind of um, way of organising um, art and art history. And so we, what the exhibition did was basically deconstruct one classification and propose a different kind of classification, um, according to Alejo Carpentier. So many people said, well, this isn't anthropology, this isn't really about culture. But in a way, I think it is. It's about how in the West we manufacture culture. And um, I don't believe that it's possible to do exhibitions on non-Western peoples without actually at the same time doing work on, on yourself as an exhibition producer, because by creating the other, you also create yourself. And this is a kind of an ongoing, an ongoing process. We did an exhibition on Man Ray and African art, um, simply because um, in North America, Man Ray was one of the um, was one of the ways the photography of Man Ray and um, other photographers at the time was how in North America, North America first encountered uh, African art, and so again it was a kind of an ethnography of um, of, um, of of the West, of an aspect of the West. We um, also looked at the problematic category of folk art, and folk art is something that um, we've done a couple of major exhibitions on. We did one on Portuguese folk art, Evan Hell and something in between, and somewhere in between, um, which really looked at folk art as a category that was um, discovered and. Um, discovered and developed um, uh, by the Salazar dictatorship in order to recreate a kind of Portuguese identity. And so really the exhibition, it looked at modernist literature, um, it looked at um, subject 19th century subjectivist philosophy. So things that were occurring outside of the sphere of fascism, um, but which were incorporated along with folk art into kind of creating a philosophy which was appropriated by um, the Estado Novo, by the um, fascist regimes. And um, we looked at how that, um, how, how that developed, how it 
uh, how it was attenuated, um, uh, how it was projected abroad in order to create images of Mexico, uh, of Portugal rather. Um, and then on the other side uh, of the page, we've also done work on um, on Mexican folk art. And again, so many exhibitions on Mexico really talk about the folk art traditions, relate them to Frida Kahlo, Rivera, the kind of post-revolutionary modernist movement. And they still do this, but um, there's no real truth to it. No? Um, really what we wanted to do was really look at folk art after the NAFTA treaty, after uh, NAFTA, because really these old kind of uh, representations of Mexico really start to dissolve with NAFTA and you get this kind of North American market. Everything starts to change. Um, and um, so really what that exhibition was looking at was again the use of new forms of folk art, the creation of new forms of folk art, uh, or popular art, we should probably be say better, um, like uh, um, like murals, like graffiti, like um, political banners, um, like drawings, political drawings and paintings. And um, we included we, we in Mexico. We we visited the families of the forty three um, students that were disappeared. Um, and um, we brought their banner to the museum, which shows the kind of a corrupt Mexican regime um, depicted using kind of early um, Nahuatl colonial style kind of um, uh, icons and, um, and glyphs. Um, we had uh, the uh, drawings uh, of children in El Salvadorian uh, refugee camps. We had two artists from a women's collective, Shipibo, an Amazonian women's collective, who were working in um, in Lima. Um, we had people who worked against the uh, introduction of genetically modified um, corn. Um, and so really the exhibition was, again, it was looking at kind of popular forms of expression, popular forms of art, but unlike the first exhibition on Portugal, looking at how it could be used as a form of resistance against, against, politi against, political, against political regimes. And then, of course, we do collaborative exhibitions. And um, for me, I think anthropology or the humanities is fundamentally collaborative. So uh, for me, it's really important, the question of what do we mean by collaborative and who do we collaborate with? What is the nature of that relationship? I remember when I came to MOA, we, I spoke to three uh, curators who gave me three different answers. For one, for one curator, it was um, really looking at a project, discussing the project with uh, uh, members of a community, um, um, really developing the idea and then going away and um, putting that idea into action and periodically reporting back. Um, for another, it was really the curator um, acting as a facilitator. And so either community, people in communities, um, or community-based artists took responsibility over for, uh, 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 for the design of the exhibition for the painting, for the text, as well as what went into it. So really the museum is um, reduced to becoming a facilitatory device. And um, a third um, idea, one that appeals to, to me um, uh, above the others, is that of the idea that culture is created through conversation, that through, it's created through, 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 through discourse. So um, as we talk about... Um, how we're going to produce a um, an exhibition, how we're going to interpret um, uh, the themes that we're going to focus on. That that whole process, the conversations between people in indigenous communities or other communities, curators, all the different agencies that kind of contribute to this, that is a real culture that has to be captured and given as a series of juxtapositions of different ideas about what you're actually looking. So it's rather looking at, so it's rather like kind of looking through a kaleidoscope. Um, and um, 
I just mentioned because it's behind me. The um, photographs of the um, uh, of um, African objects behind me is um, part of an exhibition we're working on now, which, um, on the one hand, um, wants to introduce um, collections of African art that, by and large, have, ne have never been shown. Um, but which um, exist in dispersed Canadian museums. And we think it's important to actually show them because it's a cultural resource for black Canadians and for, and for Canadians as a whole. Um, but we also want to actually show it as a form of, to encourage a conversation. Um, so the idea is to juxtapose some of these more traditional sculptures with emerging African curators, with um, black Canadian curators, and also um, people of African descent uh, living in the United States, artists of African descent living in the US. And to create a whole kind of network of um, conversations uh, around the relationship between traditional arts and modernity, um, transformation of identities, the ongoing transformation of identities, um, and very, very politically charged issues such as the relationship between curators and communities. And um, what we'll probably include here as well is um, uh, we'll also talk about whether these collections should be um, held by museums or whether, as, um, as Macron suggests, they should all be sent back to, to Africa. I should say these collections in Canada, by and large, they're not full of real masterworks like um, a lot of the European collections. They were made much, much later. Um, but still, um, questions of who should interpret them, how they should be interpreted, um, are absolutely crucial to what we do what we do so i think that's a kind of dial this dialogical kind of approach to to museum exhibitions i teach um i um i'm also a professor of art history i teach museology i've taught museology for too long 30 years or so um what i've been teaching in the last 10 years, 12 years, is really that another problem with museology is that it's a very much an anglophone subject matter that um, hides all the different types of museologies that you exist, that, it, that, that, it, that exist. So the way it's taught is um, it's self-referential. There's a lot of um, referencing that's going on between American, Canadian, New Zealand, Australian, and British museologies, which then seems to kind of be naturalized into an objective kind of uh, discourse that nobody questions. And this also gets fed into what I call operational museology in these countries. Um, it's, um, it's notable uh, that um, you know, French museology is generally completely missing. There's no, it's not discussed, but um, uh, Latin American, the tra very, very strong traditions in Mexico, Brazil, um, even in Costa Rica, where it emerged, the, uh, we're in philosophy departments at the National, at the National University, is never really kind of acknowledged. Um, we talk here about having founded collaborative museology, but in the 1970s, Bonfil Bataille, who was working in Mexico, was doing exactly the same thing. I mean, concerned about the um, concerned not only about the removal of objects from um, communities to metropolises and to museums, but also the movement of knowledge away from rural areas into urban areas, um, tried to reverse some of that by creating a museology which produced um, community-based exhibitions, part of which would could break away and then travel back to communities. And so there's a kind of a coming and going, which is um, really remarkable for the 1970s. Today, you've got museologists that are emerging in Japan, um, Korea, Taiwan, um, which are different from those of the West um, as well. Um, and in Europe, and 
I think what's ve what's very interesting is how many ethnography museums in Europe have become world museums, and sometimes this is taken to be world culture, sometimes it's world art. Um, but it involves a change of paradigm, and we've tried to incorporate that here. When I first came here, I tried to get rid of the word anthropology, and um, uh, we wanted to um, really reflect what we did, which is we were concerned with art and culture. Um, and anthropology always kind of conjures up a kind of a colonial mindset. We were told by indigenous people they didn't want to be... Um, they didn't want to be exhibited in a co in a museum that is based on a colonial discourse, whereas when we talk to people from the Indian subcontinent in particular, they told us they didn't really want to be um, displayed in a museum that was about primitive people. So to us it was really kind of important, to me it was very important to try to get rid of this word anthropology, but um, the museum is a really loved institution in Vancouver and it's been known as the Museum of Anthropology since 1976. So we spent three years um, going backwards and forwards, and um, after the big project I mentioned earlier, um, after the renewal and expansion, which we completed in 2010, we really needed to either remarket ourselves, rebrand ourselves as a new museum of arts and cultures, or go back to the old word anthropology. And since we couldn't reach agreement after three years of, um, of consultation, what we did was we decided to pull out of consultation, move to the acronym MOA, um, so not change the name really as such, but use the acronym instead of the name and have a tagline underneath which said a place, because museum too is a contested term, of world arts and cultures. And I think that's been accepted. It's never been really, strangely, it's never been refuted. And that, again, is part of um, our repositioning. Um, we don't do exhibitions in order to maximize audiences. Um, although I have to say our, our um, uh, people coming, the number of people coming to the museums has increased um, over the past um, 14 years and so from quite considerably so last year we had over 200,000 people coming but what we try to do is approach use some of these tools that I've been talking about to do interdisciplinary based exhibitions to do exhibitions that draw on different knowledge systems um, to do exhibitions um, where we put communities up front um, and to do programs that um, increasingly um, are really looking are multilingual and not just um, English programs I and mean, one of the things we're ri one of my wishes is to really kind of try to de hegemonize the um, the hold that the kind of anglophone world um, has over museums and particularly over this museum and we're in part of a ca of Canada before I came to Canada, I always thought everybody spoke French and English, no, but um, we're in part of a, Can a Canada where really we're kind of uh, unilingual um, in English too. So what we try to do is we try to do major exhibitions in um, usually in English and um, the language of the country about what the exhibition is about. So we've had Ch Chinese, Spanish, Portuguese. Um, we had seven or eight languages, uh, Asian languages, uh, in an exhibition we did on calligraphy. Um, we try to mix languages in introductions to exhibitions, exhibition openings, sometimes successfully, sometimes not so successfully when we get terribly exhibitions, terribly ambitious and we try to actually put three or four languages and <laughs> actually forget where we're going. Um, and I think this is part of a kind of the difficulty of multiculturalism. Canada defines itself as a multicultural country and there's an easy multiculturalism which is looking at the diversity of cultures and cultural expressions. And then there's a much deeper multiculturalism which involves language and looking at how language conveys different thought worlds and ways of looking at things. And um, again, we have a very large area, 18,000 square feet of the multiversity galleries, which the idea is to, again, decolonize classifications. Um, and really look at different knowledges and how different communities um, have asked us to re-display the material according to their criteria. So the Multiversity Galleries is an attempt 
and um, it's part of a journey. No, it's not conclusive. It's um, something that's still unfolding. <coughs> but there's an attempt um, to show things according to the criteria that indigenous people have have, 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 have wanted us to do so. So with the Northwest Coast galleries in the multiversity, um, the Hyder wanted us just to show their very their masterworks. They have no problem with the category of masterwork. Or at that time, it seemed they didn't have a. They just make us look good. Um, for a number of uh, Salish communities, I mean, we brought busloads of people from these communities um, to Moa to look at our basketry collections. We have very big basketry collections um, to help identify. Um, the makers, and then to really tell us how should we be displaying these. And um, the major criteria was to display them by maker, and if we didn't know the maker, then by community. And so that's what we did. In the case of the Kwakwakiwak, um, we heard that the masks needed to be displayed in terms of um, water spirits, land spirits, and sky spirits. We needed to create. Um, we needed to create a a space in which we could say communities are complex, are multivocal um, locations, and not everybody thinks alike. So what we've done there is we've kind of looked, we've we've interviewed, and we've uh, we've one young chief who believes all community knowledge can be freely um, freely shared. Um, the second interview is with an artist who believes that certain parts of uh, community knowledge can be shared, but there is still kind of sensitivities around others. And then thirdly, some uh, a community member whose opinion is that really all knowledge um, and objects are, uh, are sacred and therefore um, present problems when, when, when discussing them. And the third thing we did in that area was we... We display the work of Willie Seaweed, a really notable 19th, early 20th century artist um, from that part of the world. Um, so there are different criteria as you go through the multiversity galleries. We've worked with Pacific Island communities, with Papua New Guinean communities. We've worked with um, um, the Ghanaian community here, um, with Latin American communities. Again, looking at how they want the material, how they see how their culture should be should be presented, and that gallery tries to kind of really encapsulate and display different ways of looking, different ways of knowing, of of knowing the world. So it's kind of integral to to who we are, the identity of the museum in terms of what we do. It's critical. I would say I would emphasize absolutely it has to be critical, um, and it's collaborative. And I think for collaboration to be active, it always needs to be critical. And so it's forever moving. It's not static. Uh, it's, uh, Thank you. Right. How, what would you suggest to young anthropologists, wherever they are, how to do things better? I think, um, first of all, there are many types of anthropology. I, I, I mean, I'm an anthropologist, but I'm in an art history department. And I think certain types of anthropology, and I would, again, you know, I was uh, one of the big ins uh, inspirations to me was the work of the Annie Sociologique. And the work of the Annie Sociologique had a lot to do with a certain type of history, the Annal School history, you know, and um, of certain types of uh, art history, like uh, the work of uh, Henri Fousselon. And um, to me, you know, those, they might be different disciplines, but they have more in common than um, the anti-sociology might with, um, for example, empirically based American um, uh, anthropology. Um, German anthropology follows another different course. Dutch structuralism is, a, is another variation. Um, so I think the first thing is to really really to be aware that um, anthropology itself is um, a contingent and positioned subject. Um, I think secondly, um, it's important to be aware that anthropology 
is not as critical as you might expect it. Certain anthropologists are, but as a discipline, it's not as critical. And um, I think when I was a student in the 1970s, 1980s, anthropology was going through a crisis. No, um, first of all, there was a debate on colonialism and that um, it was a handmaiden of colonialism and that the methodologies had really grown out of um, colonial science. Um, secondly, Levi Strauss's inaugural lecture at the um, Collège de France, no, where he kind of lamented that the subject matter of anthropology is disappearing. So what does anthropology do next? And um, and then a critique that came from Oxford, which was really that kind of anthropology that is looking at different ways of thinking, different ways of knowing the world. Since we as anthropologists in the West come use Aristotelian epistemology, how would we recognize a non-Aristotelian um, system, even if we found one? Um, these are all kind of, to me, crucially important um, criticisms which anthropology, I don't think, really satisfactorily answered because at the same time, the student numbers continued to increase. Um, there was more courses, there was a proliferation of courses. It didn't have to. And I think what happened was um, you got the development of cultural studies. And some of these questions were taken over by cultural studies. And today, there's this kind of difficult relationship between the two. I think you need a reconciliation between anthropology and cultural studies, because cultural studies kind of really is a key in terms of um, bringing criticism back, a critical attitude back into anthropology. And there are great anthropologists like Paul Rabinow, who come, kind of immediately comes to mind, um, who look at Western and not only non-Western kind of aspects of society. Um, and although kind of anthropology talks about de-exoticizing itself, there's still kind of um, a focus on the non-West, and I think um, anthropology really needs, needs to look at, at Western societies, you know, the anthropology of art needs to look at contemporary art and Western art, which it doesn't by and large, there's very few people who do that. Um, and um, and then I think you kind of realize it really need to kind of look at anthropology as a humanity, not as a science like it's taught in in, in Canada or in the U.S. No, um, it is fundamentally a humanity. When I when I studied anthropology, we had to read um, Zola and Flaubert, who were described as probably some of the most sensitive and best ethnographers in terms of their descriptions of social life. We had to read Lawrence Durrell because the idea that you know you could have one story which is told from four perspectives or five perspectives, depending on what you're reading by him, and the difference and the slippages between those perspectives. So to me, um, I sometimes feel a little bit sad being in an art history department because I realise I identify with anthropology probably more than I would like to admit. Um, but it's an anthropology, to me, it's a way of being, it's a way of thinking, it's critical thought, and it's really more closely aligned with critical studies, with um, um, with um, postmodernist thought. Um, um, and therefore, you know, shares a home with literature and, 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 and poetry as much as, um, as um, well, more so, in my opinion, than empirical sciences. So I think this is the way to go forth, and I think there are some really useful tools that anthropology has. There's some really exciting anthropologists who are writing, but maybe not to take the discipline, to, to always to be critical and kind of aware of the positionality of the subject as a discipline. Um, but I, I believe um, it's used in the right way, like what we're trying we're trying to use it in exhibitions here, it can be a really strong um, um, form of um, social criticism, of, of cultural criticism, social cultural criticism. Too. And to me, that's, that's the strength of anthropology. Well, thank you very much. No, nope, a pleasure. You mm. did great. I mean, you're like remarkable, really. Because you answer all, all the questions that I had in, within it which is now going to be how you unfold all of this. Uh, but it's, it's very, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's a challenge now, and that's kind of really nice being here and being a kind of, I mean, 
it's a strange job. I mean, I think I'm the only museum director in Canada, um, whereas I'm supposed to do all the diplomatic side, raise money, but um, we're also expected to teach. And um, we're also expected to keep a really high publication record of you know, three, five papers a year. Um, but in a way, it's kind of... Um, it's really demanding, but on the other hand, it's really stimulating because um, these two areas, the academic and the research side and the administrative side, kind of fertilize each other, and you kind of create things that you never really expected to create. No, we try, we, we kind of, um, we use, um, I try to get people to use a lot of theory when they're looking at uh, uh, curating exhibitions because, to my mind, by and large, exhibitions are boring everywhere in the world, and I think they're boring because there are certain types, there's certain genres of exhibitions that get repeated over and over again, and these are very kind of, um, there are very few genres, really. Um, so we need to develop a kind of genre theory, and so we can kind of actually look at the constraints of genres and try to look beyond how we can create new genres now. Um, and um, this is something we talk about in class and um, try to develop and um, it's something that we try to develop practically um, in, in our exhibition work and, and the theory becomes like a scaffolding which is essential in order to position your practice in relationship to a wider field of practices and so you can be self-critical of what you're doing um, um, and also you know a kind of um, uh, a scaffolding which enables you to ask different kinds of questions, to look at relations between different types of disciplines, to be aware of the political elements of, 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 of what you're doing. And hopefully that results in a kind of um, a, a different type of exhibition, a new genre of exhibition, which... Um, um, which um, which takes us somewhere else. Um, and at that point, the scaffolding comes down and you're left with whatever it is that you've been able to produce as a result of that scaffolding. And to me, that's a kind of form of museology which, which can bridge the academic and the administrative, the operational, if you like. But it has to always be critical of itself because um, you know, as soon as you do something that might be different, it's domesticated by the kind of institution that you work for. So you need to kind of be aware of that and that process of domestication and naturalization that occurs because what's radical today is probably conservative tomorrow and needs itself to be to be to lead to something else now. So it's a kind of a constant it's a constant dialectical movement now it's um, between them. I would have loved to have you talk more about diplomacy as you mentioned it, but I don't ah. think we really have time. Um, I don't. I'm yeah, really it's sorry. It's, it's, a long, it's a long issue as well. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. It's but, fine, but but we but but already, so yeah. yeah. But I but I do think um, I think diplomacy is absolutely essential. I think what we do. I mean, we're kind of. Um, I'd like to think that curators are cultural critics. Um, of, although, of course. Not all curators are cultural critics, but um, I would identify with those that are cultural critics. So it involves cultural diplomacy or um, having to position yourself. I think, you know, again, for me, there's no problem about positionality, that everything we do is positioned. It's political. Everything we do is political. So we have to make a decision in terms of, you know, what side are we on? What do we represent? What do we want to achieve? Um, and that's absolutely fundamental. And um, Mo is an interesting institution because I'm the fourth director. Um, the first director was a New Zealander. The second, um, uh, a Canadian. The third, an American. And I'm, at least for a few months, more of European. Um, and uh, but despite those differences. I think we've all had the same political commitment, which is a commitment to um, indigenous people, indigenous issues, a commitment to um, marginalise, to people who are relatively powerless. Um, we do exhibitions that explore those kinds of issues, that give voice to those peoples, and that try to deconstruct the different societal apparatuses um, through which those relations are obscured. That's what we try to do. So within that, it's 
political labor, um, diplomacy and how you negotiate um, uh, relationships, and in our case, relationships, um, intellectual relationships between um, artistic, cultural relationships between people who think probably very differently, but, but also, really importantly, those relationships with the city government, with provincial government, and with the federal government, and with funding organizations. Um, we do a lot with diplomatic, uh, the diplomatic corps, um, and, um, you know, we, we, as you can tell, we have a very independent policy, so it doesn't always go down the best, uh, you know, the exhibition we did on arts of resistance, um, um, created various kind of problems with um, some of the Latin American countries that um, are represented here. Um, but it's a matter of, you know, discussing those, talking to those. I mean, there's always a lot of respect, but I think diplomacy is something absolutely fundamental. And then, you know, with all the different communities, the indigenous communities there on the coast, there's no one particular view. There's lots of different views. So again, to it's another kind of area that you have to negotiate and being a multicultural city. Um, there's all those other different kind of groups that you're negotiating and then you're trying to figure out what's the relationship between you know, those multicultural communities and interculturalism which as you get into the second and third generation in itself, itself becomes kind of uh, important. And mobile populations is something else. You know, we did a, an exhibition, what is it, Safar Voyage, which was on um, Arabic, Turkish and um, Iranian artists. Um, we chose, I think, 14 artists. And these were all artists that were living in their country of origins, but they were spending part of the year somewhere else. Now, they weren't... Um, they weren't migrants, um, um, they weren't part of a diaspora, they weren't in exile, they had just chosen to live their life um, in two different or sometimes more than two different locations which they moved between. And um, we did the exhibition um, asking questions about what is it and what impact does that have on creativity when you w move between two or more different languages, different histories, different political systems, different ways of looking at the world, different religious... Uh, what impact does that have you, on, on, on you as a person? How do you negotiate your identity? And how is that kind of identity expressed in, in expressive culture? No? Um, and um, and what it, we, we usually, after we've done exhibitions, we we discuss the implications of those exhibitions to see if they can impact um, uh, f future ideas, uh, ideas for future exhibitions. And one of the things we realized, well, okay, we chose to focus on um, uh, these groups of artists, but if we look at Vancouver itself, there's huge swathes of the Asian population that um, act in precisely this way, you know, that um, they'll spend a third of the year or maybe a quarter of the year or whatever in Vancouver, then the rest in Taiwan or China or Korea or, or, or somewhere else. And there's a constant kind of coming back and forward. So again, that's a, an incredibly interesting um, uh, phenomenon that really questions accepted ideas of identity and place and belonging that I think a lot of museums are missing no um we, we still tend to essentialize culture we don't kind of um you know we don't keep ourselves um we don't keep ourselves upset and unstable and um you know looking for these perturb um these um these different these different movements and um, wavelengths different movements. so uh, diplomacy you know is absolutely essential i would say half my job or half the job of a museum director today is probably diplomacy and diplomacy in, ter in relationship to straight diplomacy with um, people from other cultures with diplomatic missions but also diplomacy in terms of kind of conceptual based diplomacy in terms of navigating um, um, intellectual and uh, cultural artistic terrains um, as uh, 
uh, as well as the diplomacy that's involved in um, negotiating relationships, the Museum of Anthropology that's forever negotiating relationships with a really varied um, number of um, local communities. Yeah. Thank bit you on, so much. Bit on diplomacy. <laughs> but it is, it's crucial, I think it's absolutely crucial now in terms of what we do. Great, thank you so much for your time. No, thank you. That's, uh, I hope it comes out okay. Yeah. I'm sorry, towards the end of the day I get a little bit tired and so on. Well, you were more I, than... I, I talk a bit more slowly than <laughs> I do at the beginning of the day. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.